Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. Amen, amen. It is good to be here in the house of the Lord. It is good to be here here at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene. Let's begin this sermon by giving God praise once more. Amen. Amen. Let's take a quick moment. I know many uh, are actually watching online as well, so we want to say hi to our EFAM. So let's give a big hi, EFAM! Amen. If you're watching online, let us know how we can best connect and pray for you here today. All right, we are in a sermon series called, anyone know? I am. Very good. You guys have been paying attention. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus said he is I am. Jesus said I am. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tongue twister, isn't it? Amen. Well, Jesus said he is the I am. And what we're going to be doing is we're in the next several weeks taking a journey through the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. And we're going to be gaining deeper insights into knowing who Jesus said he was. Amen? Amen. Amen. So our first week was? Bread of life. I am the bread of life. That's right. Matt is ready for church today. Amen. <laughs> All right. Last week, we looked at Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Amen. So this week we're going to be looking at something different. Jesus is equating himself with something kind of strange and unusual. Amen. So what I want to do is stand, uh, have a stand this morning for the reading of the word of the Lord. And we're going to be seeing what Jesus is saying about himself today. We're going to be in John chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. And I am praying that the Lord use this word mightily. And this is what Jesus said. He says, Verily, truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, and he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's bow our heads for the receiving of this word today. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we ask, Lord, that you help unpack this for us here today. Father, as we go about, Lord, just the business of just studying your word here together, Father, and of, of taking in the, the word, uh, uh, the sustenance, Lord, that we need for our spiritual lives. Father, we pray that you just open this up to us, Lord. Help us make it applicable to where we're at. Lord, may your Holy Spirit now just go before us. Lead me as I preach this sermon. Lord, may the words I speak, Lord, be the words you need your people to hear. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You guys may be seated here together today. So, of course, today's sermon title is, I Am the Gate. The Gate. The Gate. And when I was really studying for this, I just kept thinking, like, 
you know, Jesus, I can see light of the world and bread and all of these things, but I am the gate. It's a little different, isn't it? It's something that you might hear Arnold Schwarzenegger say in one of his movies. I am the gate and I'll be back. You know, you can see that, right? I am the gate of data, okay? The gate of data. But truly, this is what Jesus said here in John chapter 10. He is saying that I am the gate. I want us to take a moment and to imagine that we are strolling through ancient Judea, ancient Israel, and we are now making our way across into the streets of Jerusalem. And all you hear is the hustle and bustle of the daily life. The air is filled with the lively chatter of merchants. There's the smell of fresh olives and the aroma of freshly baked bread. How many of you love the smell of freshly baked bread? All right, raise your hand high. There you go. It's a great smell. And now we look up and we see something that should be pretty normal. And that's an old wall opening in Jerusalem that was called the Sheep Gate. So turn to your neighbor and say, the Sheep Gate. The sheep gate. Amen. So this here is what the Sheep Gate kind of looks like. All right. So this is a Sheep Gate. You can see the shepherds with their sheep and they are moving the sheep in. If you can see um, on the flip side, it's just kind of an artist rendering. But on the inside, you can see where there is the merchants, the fresh bread, and all the lively chatter that's going on on the inside. Now, this is important because for the Jews, the sheep gate had a very, very, very critical purpose. It was the primary entryway for the sheep to be led to the temple to be sacrificed. So if I have any PETA lovers, I am so sorry. But this is what happened in ancient Jerusalem. They had to take the sheep to lead them to the temple to be slaughtered for sacrifice. Why would they do something like that? Well, you see, the Lord commanded that they had to take a pure sheep, one who was clean and one who was pure, and these sheep were used as a sacrifice, as an atonement for the people's sin. You see, before Jesus, this is what the people would have to do in order to have their sins forgiven. How many of you like the way it is now with Jesus being the atonement for our sins? Amen? I should get a get big praise God this morning. Amen? Amen. And so that's where the sheep gate came from. Fast forward to a moment that would redefine what it meant to enter into God's presence. And that's found here in John chapter 10. Jesus Christ himself declares that I am the gate for the sheep. And it's a statement that honestly may puzzle you or wonder why did he say that? I mean, think about it. Why would Jesus, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the Son of God, why would Jesus in all his glory choose to describe himself as a gate, specifically a gate for sheep. Doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's kind of weird. But we're going to find out why. Because at this moment, Jesus honestly could have described himself in any sort of way. In fact, it probably would have gained him more popularity. He could have described himself in these words. I am the conquering king, which means I'm going to make Israel great again. No one gets my joke. Make Israel great again. Okay? That's what the conquering king slogan could have been. But Jesus didn't say that. He could have said that I am the mighty warrior. I'm here to destroy the enemies of the Jews. But he didn't say that. He could have said, I am the judge and the lawgiver. You ain't seen nothing yet, Judge Judy. I'm going to make the people pay for their crimes. He could have said, I am the prophet. 
I'm going to prophesy against Rome and all of Israel's enemies, and they will all collapse. He could have said that, but he didn't. He could have said that I am the divine healer, and I'm here to make the Jews invincible against everybody that they fight against. But he didn't say that, did he? He said none of those things. Here's what Jesus did say. He said, therefore, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus came to this conclusion because of all of his misunderstandings. He was misidentified. He was mislabeled. He was misunderstood by the Jews and Pharisees in the previous chapters. In John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20, right after Jesus says that I am the light of the world. How many of you remember that from last week, right? Right after that, he was in a dispute with the Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are like the church and religious people of the day. They were the ones who kept the law. They were the ones who kept things in order in the temple. And he was in a dispute with them. You would think if Jesus was going to get into a fight with someone, that it would be someone that was a sinner, someone that was far from God. But he was in a constant battle, in a constant dispute with the Pharisees. They disputed Jesus. They said, we don't believe the testimony of that, what you're saying. There's no way you could ever be the light of the world. And then later on, again, in a dispute with the Jewish people, disputing his origin from coming from heaven and knowing God the Father. Later on, Jesus counters his critics, saying, you can't be grandfathered into the kingdom of God. You can't just be grandfathered just because you believe that you're related to Abraham. He was telling them that they needed to make their relationship with God real. Later on in John chapter 8, 48 through 58, he then refutes accusations because they kept saying, this Jesus who's healing people, this Jesus who's doing things, this Jesus, he's got to be demon possessed. He's from the devil. That's what the word on the street is. He's possessed. And Jesus again has to refute that. He had to refute accusations of being possessed by the devil. And he said it this way. He says, why would the devil do the things that I'm doing? You see, he had to emphasize his devotion to the Father. Talk about the promise of eternal life to his followers. He then led to a climatic moment where he declares his pre-existence even to Abraham. Intensifying the rage that may come from the opponents that were seeking to dispute him. And then, John chapter 9, oh, John chapter 9, 13, all the way through verses 41, the whole chapter almost. Jesus is in controversy because he heals a blind man. And then it sparks debate amongst the Pharisees again about Jesus' authority, the nature of sin, ultimately revealing this, that although Jesus healed a blind man, the blind man isn't the one who was really blind. It's the Pharisees. You see, Jesus had to point out their spiritual blindness in order for them to understand his true identity as the Son of God. And then all of that then leads us here into chapter 10. And so now, hopefully, maybe we can see why did Jesus make this statement when he said, I truly tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So today I want to dwell into the significance of this statement. And I want to uncover hopefully some more things of Jesus' identity that we can carry with us here today within our lives. Are you guys ready for that? Yes. Amen. Amen. So the first thing I just simply want to say here today is this. That Jesus is the gate that offers salvation. Amen. All right. So turn to your neighbor and say, he is the gate. Turn to the other neighbor and say, that offers salvation. That offers salvation. That offers salvation. Amen. So I'm going to read to you again verses 1 through 7 in John 10. It just simply says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. What are they? A thief and a robber. Thief and a robber. 
Jesus then says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. And Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was trying to tell them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. What is Jesus trying to tell us here today within this passage? I believe Jesus is trying to draw a line in the sand to further develop who he said he was. He never contradicted who he was in Scripture. In fact, he often spoke up about who he was exactly in Scripture. And this is another instance of that. He's drawing a line. And he's saying, this is how you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. You're going to enter in the right way, which is through me. You're not going to be able to sneak into the kingdom of God. Remember, he had told the, the Jewish people earlier, you can't be grandfathered into this thing. You're going to have to be able to come through me. Quite frankly, sometimes there's still some Christians who think that they can sneak in without having to take care of the business that they need to do by coming before the Lord. Oh, I can just sneak in if I go to church about 50 times out of 52 times of the year, I'll be okay. I'm going to go into heaven. Jesus is going to know me. He's going to love me. If I just go to church, if I just do that, or, oh, God's going to love me. I'm just going to do some really good things for other people. I'm not going to lie and cheat as much. I'm going to give a little bit of that back away. I'm going to be able to do some good things. God's going to accept me. What he's trying to tell us here today is that there's only one way. Turn your neighbor and say, there's one way. There's one way. There's only one way. And that is through him. That is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no sneaking it about. There is no trying to hide. There is no trying to rob from the kingdom of God in the sense that then God will give you credit just enough to where you squeak on by a little bit so you can get into heaven. I'm here to tell you today that that is a myth. There's only one way. Turn to your neighbor and say, one way. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Give him praise, church. And you see, the great, the great thing about Jesus is that he tells us that. You see, he kept trying to tell that to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious big shots, and they were the leaders that everyone looked up to. But here's the thing. They were leading people in the wrong direction. Amen? Amen. They were. They were leading people in the wrong direction. You see, instead of having a genuine heart-to-heart -heart connection with God, for the Pharisees, it was just making sure that people followed the letter of the law to every dotted I and every crossed T. It was all about following the law. What they were doing is basically saying, here's the law of Moses. We know God gave the law of Moses, but we want to follow and we want to do what the law of Moses says. In essence, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bow down and we're going to worship the law of Moses because we love the law of Moses. It's important. In fact, that's job security for us as Pharisees. It's the law of Moses. But they had forgotten who gave the law? Amen? They forgot who gave the law. The one who put it all together is the same God who calls out to you, who calls out to me, who calls out to people everywhere, all across the world. He's calling out and he's saying, do you want to follow me? Do you want to follow me? But instead, these Pharisees, instead of thinking about a personal relationship with God, they were too obsessed with the letters of the law. And so then comes the Son of God on the scene. And as we talked about how they were disputing 
Why? Because, well, we have an education. We've got fancy wardrobes that tells us that we're special, we're important, and we know everything about the law. You, Jesus, you're just a simple carpenter boy. <laughs> but yet they had no clue who Jesus really was. And Jesus told them several times who he was. If you just even go back to the last two chapters, Jesus is very clear about his mission, about his purpose, and who he is. But all they could focus on was the polish and the performance and the look at me kind of religion. But you see, God isn't impressed with that. God is looking for the real deal. And I'm so grateful and thankful for that because he's looking for a people who can come before him and say, Lord, I have messed up. I am sorry. Lord, I want to repent. He's looking for a people who want to come and say, Lord, I need more of you and less of me. Amen. He's looking for a people who is saying, Lord, I need to be saved. I need to be sanctified. Lord, I need to be in your presence. It's not looking for outward signs of great religious performance. Do you think that God doesn't have enough of that? What does he want? He wants you to be real with him so he can do something real inside of you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So then with Jesus on the scene, of course, he's not having any of it. And he's trying to correct the way that things are going. He's calling them out, not to shame them, but to be able to shift the focus to where it needs to be. It's as if he's saying, just Pharisees, forget all of this facade. We need to get real with God. And we need to be able to talk about your heart condition. What's on the inside of who you are, not just who's on the outside. Because at the end of the day, God wants to change us from the inside as well as the outside. And I, for one, am grateful for that. Amen? Amen. If you've been changed by the Lord from the inside out, let's just give him a big praise here today. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is very crystal clear about this. He's saying that I am the gate for the sheep. I am the way of salvation. The sheep come in through the sheep gate because they're going off to be slaughtered, to be used as atonement for the sacrifice of sins. What he's saying and what he's trying to tell the people is saying is that I am the way for that. I am here and I am the gate. I am the gate. I am the way for that. And so Jesus is saying, you have to go through me. You're not going to go through the Pharisees. You're not going to go just through the church. You're not going to go through any sort of just religious convocations. The only way, and there's only one way, the only way into the presence of God is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's give him praise, church. The next thing I want to talk about as far as this goes is that Jesus is the way through the gate. All right, so turn to your neighbor and say, he's the way. He's the way. Turn to your other neighbor and say, through the gate. Through the gate. Amen. All right. So to illuminate this a little bit, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. This is what it says. Jesus says this about himself again, mind you. He says that enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate, a narrow the road that leads to life, that only a few find it. Jesus is painting a picture here of two different kinds of gates. One very wide, very big, wide open. Woo! But it leads to destruction. Then there's a portrait of another gate. It's much more smaller, more narrow. But this gate, Jesus says, is the one that actually leads to life. He's laying out the choice of where we want our lives to go, where they need to be heading. There's a wide gate, and everybody can go in there. 
This gate, you can do what you want, say what you want, be what you want, do whatever you want to whoever you want to. And this is the gate that you go through. So you can hate on whoever you want to, you can gossip on whoever you want to, you can slander whoever you want to, you can, you can even do that to yourself. This is a wide open gate. But there's only one gate that Jesus says that will actually lead you to real life. The problem is so many of us see the wide open gate and we start treading on that. We just think, I can do what I want. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here in America. I can do whatever I want. Can you really do what you want? There are some you know, thing called laws, repercussions, the police, okay? You can't just do whatever you want to. And I'm grateful for that. But Jesus is saying this is the road that's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to your destruction. Why? Because the more that you fill yourself with selfishness and self-centeredness, and the more you fill yourself up with rage and hatred and malice, the more you fill yourself up with all of the things of this world. Because everybody in the world is traveling on this road. Everybody in the world is traveling through this gate. You know, every single person that doesn't know Jesus is, is on this road and on this path. And at first, it seems like this is a lot more fun. <laughs> but it doesn't end well. It leads to our destruction. Why? Well, at the end of this life, if you haven't made a choice on who you're going to follow, you're going to basically send yourself to a place that you don't want to be. And that place is, is hell. Now, we don't talk about hell probably enough, and sometimes I don't like to talk about it in the sense that I know there's a lot of preachers, that's the only thing they preach about. But I am here to say in astute confidence and belief that there is a hell. But I'm also here to tell you that there's a better way. And there's a heaven. And that road is narrow, and it's small. And it's small because there's only so many people that want to go on this path. You see, on this path, it's not as big. It's not as wide. Why? Because the people going on this path, it's like the sheep gate. There's only so many that's going to be able to go through. Because to follow on this road is to follow the one who is leading us down the path to life. And that is Jesus. Amen. Amen. This gate, although it may not seem as rewarding temporarily as this other gate, but this is the gate that at the end of your travels in life, you're going to be before the Lord and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, this is, this is where we're at in our lives here as humans. There's a wide gate. And then there's a narrow gate. But the narrow gate is what Jesus says is the way to true life. Choosing Jesus is choosing the narrow gate. And it's opting in and saying, Lord, I need you in my life. I need salvation. What is salvation? It's the thing that Jesus came to do for each and every single one of us in, in layman's terms. You see, the cross is a very important symbol of our faith. Not because it's fashionable, but because of what was done on the cross. You see, on the cross, it's where Jesus Christ laid his very life for you so that he could be your atonement for your sins. And it's on the cross that Jesus took our sins, the worst parts of us, the shameful things, the things that we don't even want to talk about, the things that we've done within our lives, that separate us from being in the presence of God. Jesus took all of that, put it on himself, and he saved and atoned us by his blood, by his sacrifice. And this is where the narrow gate leads. It leads to the cross of Calvary. Amen? Amen. In a world that's all about a you do you, boo boo. We serve a Lord 
that is completely radical and different, who calls us to live a life of being a servant, calls us to live a life to follow him, not to follow ourselves, calls us into a life to where we even take up our own cross. Now, being a Christian, you're not probably going to win a popularity contest. I'm sorry. But Jesus didn't come to be popular. He came to be the gate. The gate is the way of salvation. And we have to go through that gate to find salvation. And it's this is what Jesus is talking about, where he's offering us real protection, real sustenance in life, and promises and hope of an eternal life with him. And I don't know about you, but I would rather be with him than I would rather be in any other place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, this time, if I could have our worship team come up. And I'd like them just to turn to this song that we sang earlier here today, where he leads, we will follow. I want to read to you the last bit there in John chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, because this is what it says. It says that all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I want to read that again. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be what? Will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said this. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So church, here's the thing. Our world is overflowing with distractions and with counterfeit promises of what life can be. Amen? Amen. Amen. I was just talking to Jay, and he had a vacation at Las Vegas. He's just saying, man, there's just a lot of crazy things out there. And there is. There's a lot of counterfeit things that want to take your attention and distract you. But I'm here to tell you today, church, that in the middle of all the noise... Jesus stands as the one true gate that leads to salvation. And he's inviting us here today. He's urging us to choose the narrow path to find our life within him. And this isn't just about just securing a spot in heaven. <laughs> it's more than that. It's better. <laughs> it's about learning how to bring heaven here with you where you're at. Amen? It's about living a life that's right with him. And right now, this life of yours can be marked by a profound change and transformation and having a true relationship with God. Some of us may have come in like the Pharisees, where if we just say the right things, do the right things, all the outside things match up, but yet on the inside, we're as dead as dead can be. Jesus is here to tell you this. That I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. So here today, I want to invite you into that life that Jesus is offering us here. We're going to take a moment and sing through this song. We're going to sing a verse or two, but I want to open up our altar. Man, if you just need to come and experience the salvation that Jesus is offering, I invite you. I want to pray for you. And we want to be able to give you the absolute best way to live your life, and that's through Jesus. So church, let's just worship here today, but let's, most importantly, let's take care of the business that the Lord would have us to do within our lives. Let's sing where he leads me. Let's sing verse one. Where I can hear
the Savior. Amen. He's here today. Amen. 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 Well, let's take a moment. Let's just bow our heads here together today. And for those that maybe you're just struggling in your life, maybe you just need to know Jesus in a personal way, I'm just going to invite you into this prayer. And you can just say it even where you're at because the Lord is is everywhere here today. Let's just pray. Repeat after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, thank you, God, for saving me. Lord, I ask that you take my life and bring me through your gate. Lord, today, I just want to make my heart and mind and whole life right with you. And so, Lord, I offer up who I am right where I'm at. Lord, I'm praying that you will lead me and that I will follow Lord, I pray that my sin be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, thank you for your work in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you said that prayer, there's a thousand angels in heaven, Lord. They are praising God here today. Because for every single one person that goes through the gate, there's a celebration in heaven. Church, are you listening to the Savior? Amen. Let's just have a prayer of dismissal here today. Lord, we thank you, God, for gathering us here together. We thank you, Lord, that you see fit, Lord, to have us go through the gate who is Jesus, your son. Father, I pray for all of us here today to be impacted by the gate. Help us, Lord, in our lives to be led by you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 Man, let's give a shout of praise. Amen. I love you all. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.